from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Okay, and I'll remove the first three takes. Good, thank you. All right, and now we're going straight through. Okay. <laughs> Today is Monday, March 18, 2013. My name is John Dittmer, and I'm here in Baltimore, Maryland, with videographer John Bishop to interview Martha Prescott Norman Noonan, an activist in the, in the Civil Rights Movement. This interview will become part of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, in Washington, D.C. We're delighted to be here and thanks for taking time to talk with us. Uh, let's start with your family background. Where were you born and raised? Tell us something about your folks, your early experiences. I was born and raised in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, my father uh, was of West Indian descent. He was from the island of St. Vincent and he had migrated to Brooklyn um, in the early 1920s, uh, where later, about a decade later, he met my mother, who was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and uh, went to New York to work in one of the, um, one of FDR's alphabet agencies. And when she showed up, of course, there was no job. <laughs> and uh, so they, anyway, they met during the Depression, and they married, and he became an optometrist and they uh, moved to Rhode Island. Um, they were both activists. Uh, my father, I remember early, my father was involved in some efforts for uh, pan-West Indian um, unity. Um, my mother uh, came from a family that had migrated to Buxton, Ontario in the 1850s, and her grandfather um, was an activist, and why can't I think of his name <laughs> at this moment? Um, but he was active in the Negro Convention Movement, in the Underground Railroad, he was a minister, and so they had that uh, tradition in, in her family. Um, in Rhode Island, they joined the Progressive Party. At one point, my father was uh, state chairman of the Progressive Party. That was a left-wing organization. I guess so. <laughs> and, and then he got into trouble, didn't he? Well, he didn't not... Well, yes, he did, actually. Um, what, what I started to say was they tell me that um, my first uh, political act was they took me to a... Um, when I was three... They took me to an event for Henry Wallace, who was running for president. And I must have heard, you know, conversation uh, preceding the thing. And when his talk was over, I went up to him in that voice, you know, one of those loud voices that only a three-year-old can do, and said, well, you look like a nice man. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so taken with it that he... I posed with him, and oh. our picture was on the front page of the Providence Journal, they tell me. I oh. always wanted to go back and, and look oh, that, that up. That yeah. Um, but, yeah, after his involvement, uh, the, and I remember this event quite clearly. I think it was somebody from the FBI or for the Immigration Authority came to our house and threatened to deport him, even though he was a naturalized citizen. And I also remember that one of the other gentlemen in the group um, who owned a factory, a uh, jewelry factory that was big in Providence, the uh, watches, costume jewelry, where my father had worked as he was losing his sight, uh, he was called before HUAC. Mm -hmm. And he knew that his financial life would be over just because of being called. And of course, that was also on the front page of the Providence Journal. This was during the McCarthy era. Yes. House on American Activities yes. Committee. Yes. Mm -hmm. He committed suicide. Mm -hmm. It was very sad. He committed suicide. Um, so my parents were very careful mm -hmm. about activism. Mm -hmm. then, yeah. They did other things like um, try to uh, get a black teacher in the, in the public schools. I think they were successful with that. Um, and different ad hoc things as they came along. What was it like growing up in Providence, Rhode Island, a majority white town in the north? 
Well, it wasn't very pleasant for me. Um, and some of that was uh, my parents' decision. Uh, my father began uh, losing his sight when I was around five. Uh, he self-diagnosed. He knew he had glaucoma. And so part of what they did, um, anticipating that his salary, you know, the f finances in the household would be less, they closed his office and bought a house that was an old funeral parlor in a white neighborhood. Now, we lived in a white neighborhood previously, mm -hmm. uh, but this particular neighborhood was not happy about our coming there. Um, people threw stones through the window. Um, a few times I got beaten up going back and forth to school. I got called all kinds of names. Um, one of the, the, the first time I ever heard, I'm black and I'm proud, was from my mother, who told me as a young child, I must have been about six years old, she said when, you know, people call you uh, a dirty black nigger, she said you don't respond with any, eth this was a very ethnic neighborhood too, she said don't respond with any ethnic slurs. You say yes, I'm black and I'm proud of it. And that was my response at that time. The ethnic yeah. neighborhood, was it uh, Italian, Portuguese? It was Italian, Greek, mm -hmm. it was a mixture, mixture. Mm -hmm. uh, Canadian, mm -hmm. it was a mixture, yeah. How many, was there, were there many blacks in your elementary school? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was the only black student uh, when I went initially, um, and then there was a second, I still remember, she looked like an angel, Marilyn Miller <laughs> <laughs> came to school with a little pigtails. <laughs> So there was just the two of us, Lexington Avenue Elementary School. Uh, for a brief time in junior high school at Gilbert Stewart Junior High School, I was in a class with maybe four or five other black students. And then my mother arranged for me to go to, and arranged a scholarship and everything at a local Quaker prep school, Lincoln School for Girls. And I was the first year the only black student in the entire school, which ran from preschool all the way through high school. Very, very exclusive school. School, yes. <laughs> and then a young woman from uh, Hampton, Virginia, mm -hmm. also came to the school uh, in my sophomore year. Who were your friends when you were growing up? Oh. I made uh, f a couple of friends in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, there was a, a family across the street from us, and, the, and actually the, the mother, years later, told me this very interesting story. She knew when we came, she told my children this story, she knew when we came to the community, you know, everybody was against it, including her husband. And she tried to think of what kind of gesture uh, could she do. And so as soon as my father put his little sign out saying, you know, Dr. George T. Prescott, optometrist. Um, she came to get her eyes examined. And we, he had put his office sort of at the front of the house. And we divided the living room in half, so he had a little office. And uh, she said while she was being examined, she realized he couldn't see that well. But she went ahead with it. He understood, you know, the gesture. And... Um, so when the glasses came in, he told her there was no charge. And uh, she told my children that she was still using the same prescription oh. 40 years later. Oh, that's, that's a marvelous story. really nice story, story. Oh. yeah. yeah. So, there, you know, I was friends with her daughter, and there was a Canadian family uh, a little ways, about a block away, and I got to know them quite well. And at one time, I joined the Episcopal Church near us, and I was friends with the priest's daughter. Mm -hmm. And so those were my kind of local friends. Mm -hmm. um, what was Lincoln High School like? Um, of course it was a, I start to say it was a wonderful educational experience, mm -hmm. but it was to a certain point. Um, I was not allowed to join the glee club. 
Um, and I believe it was because the, at that time, the girls' prep schools, Glee Club, would have joint concerts with the boys' prep school concerts, and they didn't want me um, socializing with the young men. Now, when Carol came, she was such a phenomenal singer. She was also fair. You know, she, she did join the Glee Club. Uh, you know, my freshman math teacher told me I was too dumb to learn math. Um, it, it was an interesting experience from that, from that point of view, yeah. Racially, things were starting to happen in the South when you were growing up. Mm -hmm. um, when Emmett Till was lynched in 1955, you were just, what, two or three years younger? Uh, then he, he was 15 at the time. I was 10. Oh, you were 10. I was okay. much younger. Did that have an impact at all no. on, on, in the North, of course in the South, no. movement people talk about that as sort of an iconic mo moment mm -hmm. for them. But. It's very interesting in, 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 that you should ask that because I was thinking about, I've just been thinking about it this past week. Uh, because yes, many of the women who are in Hands on the Freedom Plow describe themselves as children of the Emmett Till, the, the generation. I didn't know anything about Emmett Till. My parents kept that from me uh, until I was in college. Um, and in fact, what I, I think of is that I was a member of the Rosa Parks generation. Um, the, of course, because I was integrating schools, mm -hmm. the whole process of school integration in the South resonated with me. Mm -hmm. And I kind of thought, you know, if they can go through that, well, I can deal with the little insults yeah. and problems that I have to deal with. Um, so I knew Daisy Bates oh. and the Little Rock Nine. That's one of my uh, earliest memories. Mm -hmm. um, and. I had the image fixed in my mind of these, because yeah, it was kindergarten students, it was elementary students, first graders, and college students integrating schools. And so that, authoring Lucy, I remember. Um, so it, it was more the activism mm -hmm. that I remember from being a young child. And of course, one of the books, the first books my mother gave me, the first books that I owned, we went to the library all the time, was Harriet Tubman. I think it was by Earl Conrad. Mm -hmm. That was the first one, book she gave me, yeah. yeah. Good copy author. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so you did, you did learn some Negro history, um, probably not in the schools, but you're, you're through your family? Yes. Um, a lot of it was musical. My mother actually sang opera. And, but she also sang spirituals. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I learned all the old uh, spirituals mm -hmm. through her. Um, and she, she contradicted not just black, she taught me some black history, but she also taught me that the history that I was learning in school, the general history, um, was off. Um, I remember at one time, you know, when this, in the middle of all this anti-communism and so forth, she said to me, oh. Oh, she said, they're just, they're just mad because they can't sell anything over there in China. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, a, it, was, it was both not trusting the history and the other thing that I remember about her is she, she was a very um, serious church woman and we went to church every Sunday. You know, she did, she's played and for churches and so forth. She's also an organist. Um, but on the occasions when the ministers might start to talk about the role of women and so forth, she would say, well, you know, she said, Martha Susan, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You don't see any women writing this, do you? <laughs> you know, take it with a grain of salt. Tell me about your church. Was it a black church? Or? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um... Well, my parents went to uh, Winter Street AME Zion Church. We, went, we were members at Winter Street. It was very small. Uh, the church was large. The church had been designed and built by a black architect, but the congregation had fallen off and was very small. 
I decided, you know, at some point that I wanted to be an Episcopalian. And my parents said, well, you can go there, but you still have to go to Sunday school and you have to go to church with us as a family. So I spent a lot of Sundays <laughs> in church all day. Um, it was a wonderful small congregation. Everybody knew everybody. Um, and because my father couldn't see, I would sometimes accompany him to the trustee meetings and the other meetings. And so I learned about basic meeting rules of order and how things are handled, the finances and so forth um, in an organization. Mm -hmm. Well, it came time for you to go to college, and you went to the University of Michigan. Uh, you said that that wasn't your first choice. Talk about the situation that led you to Ann Arbor. <laughs> well, my mother uh, was a graduate of the University of Michigan. Um, she graduated at 17, working her way through school, um, because her father died at nine. And so she had to help support her family as well as go to high school and college. Um, she determined that I should go to Michigan too. And this was what she could pay for. At that time, there weren't scholarships, uh, the kind of financial aid that's available now. Um, so she left Providence when I was a junior in high school, uh, secured a job in Detroit so that I would be certain to qualify for in-state tuition wow. at the University of and Michigan. And you and your father stayed in Providence? Right? Yes. My parents lived apart for two years. Because of you? That's right. So that I could go to the University of Michigan. And actually what she, they love this at Michigan. Actually what she told me was, you're going to the University of Michigan, and if you don't get in, you'll have to go to Michigan State. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they would love that. So you ended up in Ann Arbor at a time when things were starting to happen politically there, too. Tell yeah. us about your freshman year, your first year. Well, of course, um, I didn't expect anything. I wanted to go to Fisk mm -hmm. because I had seen a white paper on the Nashville movement. Mm -hmm. And my mother, of course, <laughs> wouldn't hear about, hear about it. Um, when I got to Ann Arbor, actually, uh, trying to remain the good Methodist that my parents had brought me up to be. Uh, I joined the Methodist Students Association on campus and they had these uh, Friday luncheon, a uh, brown bag events, and one of the early ones was they brought up two people from Macomb, Mississippi. And I remember meeting Curtis Hayes, uh, who's now Curtis Hayes Muhammad, I, they had a number of events that weekend. I followed them around to all the different events. Uh, shortly after that, in that winter, Tom Hayden came back um, from a Freedom Ride in Albany, Georgia. And so uh, we, learned, we learned about that. I joined SDS, Students for Democratic Students Society, for a Democratic Society uh, pretty much after I arrived on campus. They were... Um, the only organization talking about racism mm -hmm. and what it meant. It was an all-white organization, yeah. but, uh, and peace. That was the other thing. Were there many women in SDS at that time? Yeah, so it seemed, I think it was pretty evenly pretty divided, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, men and women. Mm -hmm. And uh, first, First, I, what I was doing was peace work. Mm -hmm. We had turned towards peace, I think, that fall and so forth. And uh, when Hayden came back to campus, and of course he was an alumni too, so he was coming back to speak on this campus, and he had been editor of the Michigan Daily. Uh, he saw me in the office and he said, I don't, you know, why are you doing this peace work? when your people are in motion all over the South. <laughs> and so he invited a group of us to an SDS SNCC meeting in April of 1962 in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And we, it was just, so, I think it was Sharon Jeffries, Mike Zweig, Kathy Innes, Dick Sleet, 
and myself, we piled into this old car. We put five dollars in for gas each way. <laughs> And we drove through the night <laughs> to get there, and uh, it was just an extraordinary experience once I was there, yeah. Who was there, do you remember? I think everybody in SNCC, who was not in jail, mm -hmm. was there. Um, my recollection is that everybody was there, and the same thing in SDS. Um, and I often think how there were, in this little chapel, was it maybe 50 people, mm -hmm. maybe 75? Um, and I think from that small group, there was the anti-war movement and the student civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So with this in mind, uh, after your freshman year, you decided you wanted to go south to work in the movement. I did. Uh, but you I didn't. Right away. I, didn't. <laughs> I was 17 at the time, and it was under the age of majority. Um, and my parents were adamantly opposed. And so. Did they tell you why? They... You know, it's very interesting. I don't think they ever said why. Mm -hmm. They just said no. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, well, they did talk about, uh, and this go, again goes back to my mother's experience at University of Michigan. Um, after she finished undergraduate school, she was admitted to the law school at Michigan, along with, I think, about five other African-American students. She felt that they were admitted by a mistake, that because all of them had attended predominantly white schools, the law school didn't realize they were accepting black students. And within a year and a half, they figured a way to flunk them out. Wow. And she felt unfairly, yeah. uh, you know, excluded. Um, so her wish, of course, well, and I think this was pretty general at the time. Her wish, of course, was that I would go to law school or professional mm -hmm. school. Um, my father's wish was that I would be an ophthalmologist. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I think it was a general wish of black parents whose children got into these white, majority white schools. I mean, it was, we were a very small group. Yeah. Um, it was expected that you would become professional, yeah. that you would um, sort of keep your nose clean. Um, we called it representing the race, mm -hmm. which, of course, I had been doing from second grade or whatever, you know, you were supposed to be polite, your clothes are supposed to be clean, and you were supposed to realize this, and it was, I mean, that you were given an incredible opportunity and that you should make the most of it. So I think that was the path that they had set me on. It was a path for which they had made tremendous sacrifices. I don't remember my, I mean, my mother was a musician. I don't remember her ever being able to attend a concert because any little extra money they had went to, my, to what she had to pay for me to go to high school. Um, they did without in order to be able to provide the education. Um, so instead of going south, you enrolled at Wayne State for summer school? I went, that's exactly what I did. The end of my, in 1962, the summer of 1962, I enrolled at their insistence, and of course, again, being very conscious of finances, mm -hmm. my mother hoped that I would graduate in three years. Oh. If, you know, if you go to summer well, school. she graduated at 17, why couldn't you? <laughs> right, exactly, <laughs> yes. It was so nice growing up with my mother. My mother was able to read. You know, I'd come home with a pile of books, yeah. you know, from school. She'd read them the first week. Yeah. She'd know it was in them. <laughs> she would discuss them with me. I was just like... But anyway, um, so I enrolled at Wayne State. I chose two courses by uh, just guessing because they were early in the morning. Uh, and I ended up with two professors who were in Facing Reality, uh, a group led by C.L. Hardin James. Wow. <laughs> it was uh, George Rowick, mm -hmm. who did a book yeah. on slavery, uh, slave narratives, and uh, Seymour Faber, who was a sociologists. And I picked them in the morning because by that time, SNCC had sent Bernard Lafayette mm -hmm. to Detroit to raise money. Oh. 
So I spent the mornings in these classes, and the one the Faber's class was a class on social change. Uh, Rowick's, if I remember correctly, was European history from 1848 to 1917. <laughs> there was one revolution after another. <laughs> And uh, then in the afternoons, I work with Bernard and the Friends of SNCC group. Um, Elizabeth Hirschfeld, who was a freedom writer, um, was the main other person. But also, a lot of young people who had been active in civil rights in Detroit joined the uh, Friends of SNCC group. And uh, a good number of them later became active on campus, they took over the South, the newspaper, Wayne State University of the South End, and they were instrumental in the, um, uh, oh, the thing with Foreman and the, the black labor yeah. group. I'll think of the name yeah. in a minute. Um, so, and they were, it was uh, John Watson and Luke Tripp, and they were already supporting um, the North Carolina, Robert Williams, and uh, they were reading Negroes with Guns, and they were getting um, the Peking Review. <laughs> they were very political. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a very political group. Um, and eventually we had people from a wide spectrum um, of the left, from the Catholic Workers Party. Just, it was just a nice group of people. Yeah. Um, but there was work to do, and that's pretty much what we all did together. We just did support work for the students in the South. Mm -hmm. hey, rolling. Um, then in the fall, you went back to Michigan. I went back to Michigan. Mm -hmm. and what, where was your mind that year? What were, what, were you concentrating on your studies? Did you have a plan? Uh, no, I'm not even sure how much I went to class. I think I spent most of my time in the student activities building. Um, one of the things I want to mention that happened before I went, that at that summer that we did the Friends of SNCC work, mm -hmm. at the end of the summer, our culminating event was bringing Diane Nash mm -hmm. to Detroit. The, who was very prominent in the SNCC and in the Yes, she, yes, and at that time she was working in Mississippi, and she was under indictment in Mississippi, and her sort of tagline at the time was, "My yes, my baby might be born in jail, but anywhere a black child lives in Mississippi, they're in jail already. But what I think was important to me as a young woman was that she was the star mm -hmm. of the summer. Yeah. Um, Bernard Lafayette is no mean speaker himself, but he chose to put her forward mm -hmm. rather than himself. And, uh, and the way he worked was very democratic. Um, so I learned more about the SNCC way and so forth that summer. But to see her, uh, she was nine months pregnant. Yeah. She delivered, she left Michigan in labor. And it said a lot about what a woman could do in the movement to me. Yeah. So I went back to school. I set up a Friends of SNCC group in Ann Arbor. We brought the Freedom Singers in. We did a variety of activities. Um, I think it's, that's 62, 63. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think it doesn't sound right. Okay, it was 62, 63. I plan to go south in 63 when I turned 18, but I didn't. Um, my parents came to <laughs> visit me in the fall of 1962 and... They were back in Providence then? No, they're st in Detroit now. Detroit, See, my Detroit, mother has Detroit. moved to Detroit. And uh, they realized I had difficulty remembering exactly where my classes were located. <laughs> and they said, you know, we're not paying you, we're not paying for you to sit in the student activities building. And I said, well, fine, you know, don't send me any more money. I'll manage on my own. <laughs> the, <laughs> the hubris you of a kid. You're independent. Right. Um, 
and that was the case. You know, from then on, I had to make arrangements for my own uh, education. And then in the summer of 63, you do head south. I do finally go south. Defying your parents. Right. I kept hoping in the winter that I could convince them mm -hmm. that it was okay. Uh, they made it clear that if I went, I would not be welcome to come back home again. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that situation. Um, but I did slip away at the end of the semester in 1963. And you ended up in Albany, Georgia. I did. With the project headed by Charles Sherrod. Sherrod, yeah. You were there a brief time. But talk about what it was like in Albany. Well, the first thing we did was we had um, orientation in Sumter County. Uh, and that's where, again, the whole SNCC philosophy of uh, following what the people wanted, not thinking of yourself as a leader, but as someone who can be of assistance and to listen to, to be guided by what community people wanted to have. Um, even Albany, even, was fairly frightening to me. I was scared the whole time I was there. Um, shortly after I arrived um, at orientation, a young woman, I believe in Sumter County, was raped by 13 white men, one of whom was, the, I think, the Sunbeam bread man, and he parked his truck in front of her house the whole time. She died from the infections and so forth that she received. Uh, and that, that was, a, it was just a huge eye-opener for me because I thought bad things happened, but I thought the really bad things were over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that wasn't the case. And I thought something like that could happen to me. I mean, that was... Uh, even more frightening. Uh, the movement, uh, they I don't know, they say at the time that the movement was not what it had been before. I can only imagine what it had been before because we were still having huge mass meetings. Yeah. Um, and of course the music, yeah. the lining of the hymns and the music was just uh, uh, amazing. Was Bernice Reagan there then? No, because the Freedom Singers were on, right. they were on tour, but, but it, it, did, all started. it didn't matter. <laughs> I mean, the music was yeah. just, uh, the line, uh, Sherrod is no mean singer yeah. either. He, yeah. you know, he would lead the mass meetings and so forth. Um, and Reverend Wells mm -hmm. uh, was there and C.B. King uh -huh. was there. Um, going back to my parents, uh, at one point, the, I, I felt kind of safe if I stayed within the black community. I felt like the real danger was when you started to march downtown, etc. So I was staying in the black community. And um, still, they came around, some of the police came around and arrested, kept arresting people, arresting people. So Sherrod had us take sanctuary in a church, which we did. But then uh, I guess there were white men driving by with guns hanging out the window and so forth. And Joanne Christian's father and her cousin, I think, Monroe, I'm losing his last name, but I'll come back with it. Uh, they sat on one side, one sat on the side of the church, church was on the corner under a light, one sat at the front of the church with a rifle across their laps, which I think uh, kept us from any uh, severe reactions. But my mother heard about this through her, our sorority. There were, th I think there were three women at the church who were Deltas. Myself, uh, Joyce Ladner, and Joan Browning, who'd been an um, exchange student. And so the Deltas sent out this alarm, and the head of the Deltas at that time was from Albany, Georgia, Jean Noble. So um, my mother, who was not speaking to me, <laughs> thrown me out of the family, uh, got worried. And so she called an old high school friend of hers, Neil Stabler, who was a Democratic committee. And, and he put her in touch with someone in the Justice Department. And she worked her way up to this. is, And she never told me this. 
family members told me this story after she died. Evidently, they had been sworn to secrecy. <laughs> so, that, so the way they told it was, you know, she finally got to Burke Marshall. Assistant and, Attorney General. Assistant <laughs> Attorney General at the time. And he passed her off to Robert Kennedy. And when she got to Robert Kennedy, she, Robert Kennedy assured her, you know, she said, hey, I'll be sure that no harm, you know, comes to your daughter, Mrs. Prescott. You don't have to worry about a thing. And she said, well, I hope so, young man, because I would hate to have to talk to your brother about this. <laughs> <laughs> That's marvelous. <laughs> and after that, I couldn't get arrested. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I could just go anywhere. <laughs> Oh, important yes. point yes. in the larger scheme of things. Yes. Okay, John, we're back. You have written that uh, although this was a nonviolent movement, that you engaged in what you called preventive nonviolence. Talk about that. Well, I think uh, my first um, exposure to this was in Albany, Georgia, where um, Sherrod would let the gangs know when there was going to be a demonstration. And they would position themselves between the white crowd and the, the nonviolent demonstrators. And of course, in these communities, everybody knew everybody. Mm -hmm. And so the people in the white crowd knew that there was this group of non-nonviolent people <laughs> they had to go through to attack the demonstrators. And that kept the violence, I think, down. Um, we didn't hesitate to ride in cars with community people who were armed, or to stay at the homes of community people who were armed. Um, and I think, again, this protected us a great deal. I mean, the, the, uh, Mr. Christian uh, and his cousin sitting on that porch, I think, kept people from shooting into the church. It's just an amazingly brave thing to do. Yeah. 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 So you were protected by the local people? Too. Yes. Very much so. And then soon you realized that uh, Sherrod had pulled a trick on you to keep you in mm -hmm. Albany and mm -hmm. you were really expected in Greenwood, Mississippi. Exactly, yes. He, he told us that um, because uh, Medgar Evers had just been killed, it was too dangerous for us to go to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. But when we called over to Bob to find Bob Moses. Moses, to Bob Moses, to uh, just to say hello, he was, he was waiting for us. So uh, when Sherrod was out of town, <laughs> because we were afraid he would talk us into we staying, uh, Gene Wheeler and myself, uh, we were afraid he would talk us into staying, mm -hmm. we got on a bus and went to, to Greenwood, Mississippi, where we, I spent the rest of the summer. Well, Greenwood by that time had been in the national news. There had mm -hmm. been uh, demonstrations. The police had set dogs loose on people. Mm -hmm. The Justice Department had gotten involved in a way. So taking that bus into Greenwood, what were your thoughts and, and what did you find when you got there? Well, again, I was scared. <laughs> uh, and uh, when we got there, I think Sam Block and uh, Willie Peacock picked us up. They had a car, it was like a bumblebee, it was yellow and black. And uh, when they picked us up, they must have driven through Greenwood at 80 miles an hour. So then I had another thing. Was I even going to make it to the office? <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, yeah, Block and Peacock were the original two SNCC people who went into Greenwood. Yes. And so that you were being met by the people who started it all. Yes, yes. And, you know, of course, they were heroes to us and so forth. Um, and that summer, we were working on getting uh, people to the polls in groups, uh, in large, as large numbers, having voting days, having a voting day, rather than taking two or three people down at a time, and so forth. And um, so my job was really uh, to get familiar with the community, mm -hmm. and set, I had learned this working with SDS and Democratic Party, and you know, setting up how which homes had already been called on, which ones hadn't, so forth, and so on. Mm -hmm. So there were still a lot of attempts made to register. Yes, we had a we had a voting day at the end of the summer, is what I remember, with two or three hundred people. How many at of them were successful? Do you think? 
Yeah. Oh, I don't think anybody was successful. That, that they were I, using all of the devices they could. They just didn't, weren't registered. Such as inter interpreting the Constitution. And, now, you, I actually never went inside. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what happened once people went yeah. inside. Yeah. Um, but I know that nobody got registered. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, yeah. uh, nobody got registered. Mm -hmm. But they were so brave to keep coming back and attempting to, to yeah. register. People drove, again, people were driving by, white men were driving by the office with their guns out and so forth. Contrast, compare and contrast, will you, with, with the, and I've been interested in this, uh, the way Sherrod was running the Albany project and the way things were being run in Greenwood. Well, Mississippi was, uh, Sherrod's project, this, this, the, there were white volunteers mm -hmm. in Albany. Um, there were a couple of white volunteers in Mississippi, mm -hmm. two men, but they never left the office. Mm -hmm. um, it was too dangerous. Um, dangerous for them and for the community. Yes. So they actually lived, bathed, ate, <laughs> everything in that office. Uh, I would say that for me, and this was part of what attracted me to this movement, they were both black projects because the movement itself was black. Um, when I was in Albany going to mass meetings, you know, there are 700 people in the church. Um, maybe there are 10 white volunteers there. I'm not sure that's integrated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, integrated to me is a, more of a 50-50 mm -hmm. kind of uh, a situation. Um, the culture of the movement was black. Sherrod was in charge. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't a situation where he was sharing with a white person to run the project. When he left, Prathia took over. Um, so. For me, there wasn't that much difference. Now, the, uh, but, but again, this is what attracted me to yeah. them. What I saw in Chapel Hill were young black people in charge, taking charge of their destiny. That's what attracted them. We could do something about our own situation. We could actually change things. Yeah. Um, so in Mississippi, um, pretty much the same <laughs> yeah. as far as I felt it, as I experienced. Mm -hmm. So you were happy to be in a black run, black project. Yes. Um, you were a woman in that movement and a lot has been written in recent years about the role of, of women in the movement, mm -hmm. the mistreatment, alleged mistreatment of women. What was your experience? I certainly never felt mistreated. Um, and I, I felt encouraged to be as, sort of as much as I could be. Um, I, didn't I felt myself a novice in these situations. I mean, I had never <laughs> been in a, what was, I guess, a war zone to me uh, before. So I was feeling my way and learning, but I felt encouraged to do as much as the men were doing, um, or as, as just as much as I could do. We were college students, um, so certainly we were treated as if we were smart. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, I don't, never felt that someone looked down on me um, through that experience. Um, Did women have roles they were expected to perform? Not that I was aware of. Taking we did minutes at meetings and things like this. So. I don't. I don't remember anybody taking minutes yeah. at the meetings. I was. Somebody did because somebody I read a lot probably of them. did. <laughs> but one of the things I noticed. Was, I never did. Was in reading the minutes of the meeting, you would not. You know, they would have the names of people who were uh -huh. talking, but if you didn't, you wouldn't know which gender was. Uh -huh. you know, nobody was putting down somebody because of their gender. Uh -huh. uh, but that's something, that, of course, has been out there. Uh -huh. So you were in, uh, in 63, things are going in Mississippi, and then what did you do in the fall? Um, in the fall, we went to the March on Washington, um, and I went home to try to reconcile with my parents. 
talk a little bit about the March on Washington. Was that a great experience for you? Um, actually, the March on Washington, after being in Mississippi, it seemed kind of too civilized or something. Um, sort of toned down. You were with the SNCC people who were there. From Mississippi, yeah. Um, and I remember my identification was with the people coming in jeans from Danville mm -hmm. and the people coming from Cambridge, Maryland, mm -hmm. where they had had a hard-fought uh, summer. Uh, they did have seats for us, for Miss people coming from Mississippi. We got to sit at the front. Oh. Uh -huh. So, Just you know. like in the Democratic Convention, you were honored guests. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So that, we, you know, we picketed the Justice Department the night before, and then um, we came to the march. Um, of course, the, the numbers of people there were, it was just so impressive. Um, but I think the, you know, reaction to John's proposed speech. This is John Lewis who John, yeah. had his speech censored. Yes, the, the fact that the, his speech was censored. Um, I remember being slightly conscious that there weren't that many women uh, speaking on the program. Um, and just f at that point, I felt like a soldier in the Civil Rights Army. Um, the other thing that disturbed me, I, I uh, Du Bois died on that day, yeah. and Wilkins, uh, Roy Wilkins, who's head of the NAACP, made actually a disparaging remark. I don't remember what it was. Well, I felt he made a disparaging remark about Du Bois, and I thought it was just, how could you be so yeah. cheap, yeah. Or someone? Still holding a grudge. Yeah, yeah, and that that's my recollection of the march. And so then you went back, you say, to try to reconcile with, with my parents. parents. And I carefully went back after, I did some fundraising first in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts, and then I went back to try to reconcile with my parents, and I carefully went back after classes started at University of Michigan. But what my mother knew was that classes had not started at Wayne. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and she faked a heart attack. She faked it. To keep me oh. at home. And years later... Your mother is one of the most interesting people <laughs> <I've heard. laughs> Years later, I asked her, you know, how could she have done that? And she said, I, I would have done anything to keep you out of Mississippi. Anything. And when I was, you know, working on the bridges for hands, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly reading your book, the level of violence in Mississippi in those years was incredible. Yeah. It was absolutely incredible. I got chills all over again mm -hmm. thinking of how dangerous it actually was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you were aware of that at the time, but it didn't deter you at all. I was a... No, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew I was risking my life. Mm -hmm. I knew it was dangerous. I did not know that the Klan or the White Citizens Council had a list of people mm -hmm. that they had successfully murdered. Mm -hmm. I knew people were dying. Um, but I think I was not just, I think it was neither aware of the level of violence mm -hmm. nor later of the level of surveillance. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we joked about it, but I didn't think it was. Yeah, the surveillance yeah. was that great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were up north at Wayne State, and uh, then well, you... John, can I ask you yeah. a question? Um, you referred to John Lewis being censored, and uh, I've heard it's come up several mm -hmm. times. Could, um, could you just say why he was censored or what he was censored about? I think they felt the, uh, the speech was too radical, and if I remember correctly, he had something in there about marching through the South like Sherman, nonviolently. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that didn't go over well. <laughs> Which didn't. But again, it's, it's this, this polite, this 
the march is on a different level than the level on which we were working, yeah. I felt. And, and one of the things I think was that the march was turned around to be an endorsement of Kennedy's Civil Rights Bill. Mm -hmm. And in that first draft of the speech, he said, it's too little and too late. Mm -hmm. And that was a no-no. Yeah. That, uh, that they uh, would, uh, several people would have dropped out if, if, yeah. uh, if he would have done it, so a compromise was made. It's still a strong yes, speech. But they had distributed copies in advance, so yeah. the press knew yeah. exactly what it was. Well, I think he asked, I want to know which side the federal yeah. government is yeah. on. Yeah. And that was not acceptable mm -hmm. at the time either. Mm -hmm. And I think it was more mm, the, 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 the traditional groups, mm -hmm. not necessarily SELC, but... Mm -hmm. So... You're up north in the summer in the sum, uh, in uh, 1964. The summer of 1964 was the time of the summer project, mm -hmm. later known as Freedom Summer in, in Mississippi. Three civil rights workers being killed, national and international attention. Um, why didn't you uh, go back to Mississippi that summer? Well, uh, two reasons. Um, I actually was opposed to the summer project. A number of SNCC field secretaries were. Right. Why were you? Many. I think, yeah. the, I think the whole Mississippi staff almost. Yeah. Except Bob Moses. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> um, because, again, I, saw, I felt that the idea of having uh, black student organizers in the black community in the South, mm -hmm. I thought that was sound. It worked. Mm -hmm. um, and... So when I realized they weren't recruiting black students, I was discouraged. And the second thing was I figured out if I went to summer school mm -hmm. in 1964, I could finish school that following fall. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, that would just be checking off yeah. <laughs> one objection that my parents like had. Your parents. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. But you did go to Atlantic City in August when the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party challenged the, the legitimacy of the all-white Mississippi mm -hmm. delegation. What I, was that like? What, were your, what was your role there? I did go, and um, even previous to that, I did some work with Detroit Friends of SNCC mm -hmm. because uh, the Michigan Democratic Party was the first mm -hmm. party to in, uh, support the MFDP. So um, we were all proud of that. Uh, I went, I went, I, had, I was at that meeting where, you know, first we were just generally, you know, uh, demonstrating on the boardwalk. Um, and I went to the meeting where people came to talk to the Mississippi Democratic uh, delegation to ask them to support, to encourage them to support the two seats, the offer of the two seats. Um, and I remember Mrs. Hamer getting up when it was over. I remember two or three things. One was, I think a gentleman from the Council of Churches was so embarrassed by the position that he was taking that he Spike, was it, but, uh, he he looked down. He was red in the face and looked down through the whole time that he was making his presentation. Uh, and then you know, Miss Hamer got up and basically said, "I know what democracy is. First of all, we should get to choose yeah. who our representatives are." They had and appointed uh, the Johnson Aaron, administration had appointed Ed King and Aaron, Aaron Henry. Henry. Yeah, and so uh, and. The vote went with her, mm -hmm. and I thought it was a wonderful victory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was a one. I thought, and and it's not just about this specific event. I thought it was absolutely amazing that within the space of what was that two years mm -hmm. of activism, with basically no money. We had made the vote a national issue. Mm -hmm. It was on the national agenda. Yeah. It wasn't going anywhere yeah. after that. Um, 
And to me, it's the whole movement was like that. That given the opposition against us, Given that there was, I felt only this, there was just this small historical opening mm -hmm. to make change. Yeah. I think we blew it wide open. Yeah. And so, in that sense, I always felt encouraged. Mm -hmm. I felt as if we were, um, you know, there's a, a, a point in Chicago where there's a mass meeting, I think after they've gone into Cicero and the rocks are coming mm -hmm. down and everything. And Mahalia Jackson sings before King speaks, and she sings Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. And I, that just to me was such uh, the perfect image. I felt not that we were sort of marching around the walls of racial oppression or segregation with horns, but we were leaning on it, and it was tumbling down. Yeah. And it did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stop. Okay, we're rolling. John, can you back up just a little bit? Okay, we're, we're going to go. Oh, so Alabama. You, you yeah. were attending the University of Michigan, and you made most of your credits for graduation at the end <laughs> of the fall semester of uh, 1964. And then early in 1965, you joined the Alabama SNCC Project. Talk a little bit about that. What was going on? What you found there? Okay. Um, well, at first, uh, when I went to the Alabama SNCC project, I was going on the weekends because during the week, I was long weekends. I was also working on a project uh, with Pat Gurn from the University of Michigan, studying the uh, vocational aspirations of students at black colleges. And one of the colleges was Tuskegee. So in that process, we got to know a lot of the activist students. And another uh, SNCC person, Doris Derby, was on that uh, study. And, and another historian, John Bracey, oh, wow. was uh, mm -hmm. also one of the interviewers. Um, so we got to know uh, the students at Tuskegee, the activist students, and they were having mass meetings. Um, and they actually um, tended to get together Oh, around 11 or 12 o'clock in the daytime and, you know, kind of socialize the rest of the day. Um, in Selma, when I worked in Selma, I worked in uh, a ward of Selma. I was assigned a ward. And th we did in Selma whatever the people coming to the meeting wanted us to do. It could be something as simple as getting a stoplight on a corner uh, or as complicated as uh, trying to get black women hired at the Dan River Mills, which of course paid more. I think um, the thing that struck me in Selma, and I th Mississippi was probably a little bit less, in Selma the going wage for day work was $12 wow. a week for a six-day mm. week. Um, so, uh, the, we worked at Dan River Mills, um... Did you have any success there? I believe the women got hired. Mm -hmm. That's my memory. Mm -hmm. I'm not yeah. sure yeah. of it. Um, so we were doing sort of economic projects. We also, um, I was working with people in another, who were working in another ward where, uh, the men working at the Pepsi plant wanted to unionize. Mm -hmm. And we worked with an organizer from the AFL-CIO who uh, came in at night. The meetings had to be at night. He had to park. No, nobody parked all in front of the house, you know, and they'd come in. Uh, so that was the trade union organizing. And we were still um, taking people, going with people to register to vote. Um, uh, later on, we challenged the assignment of the poverty funds to the mayor and so forth. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it was about this time, early in 1965, that Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian mm -hmm. Leadership Conference came to Selma with the intent of dramatizing something that the Civil Rights Act of 64 didn't cover, and that was the right to vote. Yeah. Uh, they came to Selma to make a big splash, to put pressure on Congress to pass the law. 
SNCC had been working quietly in the community for a couple of years. Talk a little bit about that dynamic when SCLC came mm -hmm. and how things changed or didn't. You know, I think too, and maybe this is a little off the subject, my firm belief, and I don't know if this again will be proven when things are, um, all the records are open and so forth. I suspect that after the MFDP challenge and the kinds of people that the MFDP represented, somebody said, you know, we can't let this radical SNCC organization create a populist party yeah. in the South. And you guys in SELC should do something about this. I do know that in the fall of 64, there was a meeting held in New York with Al Lowenstein and lots of other liberals, yeah. the intent of which was to make sure that FDP did not get support. Yeah. And there is a, also a, a document from an SELC meeting mm -hmm. about kind of uh taking taking up the issue of the mm -hmm. vote and being in the middle of SNCC projects in Mississippi and Georgia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um so anyway, we were not um well I remember in particular we weren't like overboard about mm -hmm. uh, SCLC coming into Alabama which had had a SNCC presence. Yeah. I think Lafayette was there in 1961. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and at, at the same time, it's not like there was um, hostility. Mm -hmm. uh, we all ate together yeah. at the Walker's <laughs> <laughs> Cafe. Um, you know, we're certainly talking with each other. I mean, it wasn't. Did you get to know King there at all? Oh, I just met him a couple of times. Yeah. I think Andy Young was there more. Yeah. And we got to know him. Yeah, uh, he was, was going in and out. He was in and out, but Andy was there a lot. Um, uh, at that point, uh, Diane and Bevel were working yeah. for SCLC. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were certainly friends, yeah. friends with them. Um, and so it was a kind of an interesting arrangement. Mm -hmm. And actually, in the wards in Selma, there was a SNCC person assigned to each ward and an SCLC person assigned to each ward as an attempt to kind of work together uh, through this. But they tended to be promoting demonstrations and, you know, we were community organizers. And so we were doing more actually kind of local groundwork kind of things, I think. Um, the world became aware of Selma at Selma Bridge, yeah. when the police attacked demonstrators, uh, tear gas, clubs. Mm -hmm. um, talk about that and the impact that it had uh, on SNCC and mm -hmm. what it was doing at the time. Well, even though at the time um, SNCC had taken an official position against supporting uh, the, the march to Montgomery and so forth, though there were SNCC individuals like John Lewis, Bob Mance, uh, participating in the march. Um, after Bloody Sunday, you know, everybody <laughs> uh, came to Selma. And the, the SNCC staff in Selma that had not been participating in the march also participated in the next march, um, which we call the U-turn march. Why is it the U-turn march? Because basically, you know, everybody was all revved up and they were ready to go across that bridge and to go through anything. And when they got to the bridge, um, the leadership, the SELC leadership, stopped, said, let us pray, and led the march back to Brown's Chapel. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a very yeah, uh, yeah. disappointing. They did that probably because a deal was made that yeah. they wouldn't be attacked as long as they turned around and right. came back. Right. Um, after that, why uh, there was a federal uh, permission to march, yes. and uh, so the march from Montgomery, Selma to Montgomery got underway and was completed. Were you on that march? 
Um, I didn't actually uh, go on the march, and I'm, I'm just going to go back to a second. There's a, a very interesting story in, um, in the Hands on the Freedom Plow, written by Faye Bellamy, where she describes going with, I think, Foreman and Stokely to a dentist's house in Selma the night before this march, where Foreman and Stokely were pleading with King to go against his principles and break the federal injunction. But the thing that was interesting was like they knew where he was. Yeah. They came in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. and he got up <laughs> and met with them, mm -hmm. but he was also on the phone in the other room with the, yeah. the yeah. federal King authorities. had a difficult role. Yes. <laughs> I kind of feel sorry for him sometimes. But, um, so now I'm forgetting your question. Well, no, that, that, uh, you did <laughs> oh, not did, go on the march. I did not uh, go on the march, but I did go into, well, there were two things. So also at the same, t what SNCC did at the same time was have demonstrations in Montgomery. Mm -hmm. So I did go and watch the demonstrations in Montgomery because students from the University of Michigan came down. There was some kind of relationship between Tuskegee and the University of Michigan, an institutional relationship between the two schools. So you were in Montgomery then with all of the violence there? I was in Montgomery. Um, I left when I knew things were going to get mm -hmm. rough. Because again, we had taken the position that we were no longer demonstrators. Yeah. We were community organizers and we were going to focus on that uh, community organization. Now, I did go into Montgomery mm -hmm. on the day the march mm -hmm. culminated. What were your feelings then? Um, it was sort of ho-hum. You know, we, we expected it to happen. We knew, and we were at um, the church. Uh, it's right on the corner by the Capitol. Yeah. So we could hear the mm -hmm. speeches, and we were feeding people. I mean, yeah, that it was, was basically. Church, I think. It, was that King's Church when he I believe so, and I, I want to call it Ebenezer, and that's why no, I know I'm no, wrong. That, no. <laughs> It's the, it's the Montgomery Bus Boycott Church. I can remember Coretta saying marching past that yes. church and all that symbolized for um, And it was, what I thought was beautiful was to see how many community people mm -hmm. were participating mm -hmm. in that march, you know, because the streets of Montgomery were full. You know, there was a point where we couldn't, drive anymore, you know, we had to park the car and walk the rest of the way and so forth. Um, and then the march ended and the news, the press went away and you went back to work, right? Right, it, and I think that our concern was even in what was proposed in a voting rights bill didn't offer any protection mm -hmm. for people who were trying to register to vote yeah. and for uh, uh, workers, for voter workers. And so, I, you know, I remember kind of being like, oh, well, another bill mm -hmm. won't protect us, won't protect people, etc. Yeah. Well, I, I want, in a second I want you to talk about what it was like registering people in that area once the Voting Rights Act was passed. Mm -hmm. But at, it was at this time that Sophie Carmichael was uh, going off for the march and organizing people in Lowndes County, mm -hmm. uh, Alabama, which became the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, the first Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. uh, you have changes going on in SNCC, and uh, you were continuing to be active in Alabama, and mm -hmm. uh, not much has been written or said about that. I wish mm -hmm. you could. You could go into detail. I believe the Medical Committee for Human Rights uh, there, had yeah. a project there. Mm -hmm. What were you doing after the march? Um, after the march, was still, we were still canvassing. Um, the thing that I remember was people were going down to register in droves. And I was making some attempt. We had these sheets of uh, people who had gone to register, etc. And I was making some attempt, which I never did finish, of trying to organize them by wards mm -hmm. so that we would have the information of who was registered, who wasn't. Um, you know, now it became more of a, uh, an administrative mm -hmm. kind
kind of thing because people they sent in um, federal registrars, yeah. so people weren't having any difficulty getting registered. So it was a matter of motivating them to get out and register. Yeah, well, people were going in droves. We yeah. didn't have to do anything. Yeah. I mean, they were just going in droves. But the, the, the thing in Selma is we were thinking about, okay, now there's going to be elections. Yeah. Can we start organizing? Mm -hmm. But by that time, everybody was pretty much out in the counties. And as you, as you say, the focus was on Lowndes County mm -hmm. and the idea of an independent black uh, political party. Um, and that's where um, SNCC's efforts went at that Did time. Did you work in Lowndes at all? I visited mm -hmm. Lowndes. I, I was there, I think, for the first uh, mass meeting. And um, I thought it was interesting that people, you know, as soon as that meeting was over, the people in Lowndes County had a set arrangement about how they were getting home so no one would be yeah. in danger. Yeah. It's like, oh, we've done this before. Yeah. <laughs> right? you know? um, but I didn't, and I spent, I think I spent a couple of weeks there mm -hmm. uh, when I came back to Alabama. I went home for a little while and came back to Alabama. Um, but it was not, my Selma was my mm -hmm. permanent place. I was at the meeting we were at a Boy Scout camp, I think. We ha had a meeting where the whole discussion was about the formation of an independent black political party and the Black Panther. I, of course, wasn't so hot on the Panther. I wanted a black star, but that was... <laughs> <laughs> I, don't even, problem, I don't even remember. <laughs> I don't even remember if I had the nerve to say anything yeah, yeah. about it. But um, I, I actually believe in nonviolent direct mm -hmm. action, mm -hmm. and um, I thought the Panther was a little over the top. Mm -hmm. I, you know, um, and I liked something that would have connected it to the African. Yeah. Struggle, which I think a, a black star would have done. Yeah, could you explain what the black star is? Uh, Marcus Garvey um, had the black star uh, line, the line, the steamship line. line is a symbol, and then uh, Nkrumah I th picked it up, I think, for the airlines, mm -hmm. for the Ghanaian airlines. So, you know, there was that. I mean, that this is in the back of my mind say, compared to a Black Panther, yeah. you know. You know. I just worked with some rock with, yeah. in Jamaica with Rastafarians, and of course Marcus Garvey and the oh, Black yes. Star's very big there. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, the, my father always referred to him as the Honorable <laughs> Marcus Garvey, you know. Um, and I also think, I remember, I, I did not have the same understanding about the importance of black institutions as some of my SNCC colleagues at that time. I thought it didn't make a difference. If you had a Lowndes County Freedom Organization and that organization wanted to field independent candidates one year, Democratic candidates another year. I thought it was all fine. Yeah. But that shows my separation from the thinking mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was not representative at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you were in Alabama in the, the ensuing months in, in 1965, um, what was, you, you've had the, the, all the attention in Selma, what were race relations like in the period after the march until you left? Did things improve at all? Did they get worse? They stayed the same? Well, one of the interesting things was when we challenged the poverty funds, mm -hmm. the mayor started meeting with us. Mayor Smitherman. <laughs> um, he was very cordial and pleasant. And of course, um, was there a cat board, a community action program board there that was, was in charge of all that? All I remember was that the mayor mm -hmm. 
was in charge of the poverty funds. And we held several mass meetings to have the community support to challenge it. Uh, but I left, actually, before that whole process mm -hmm. was finished. And I don't know yeah. what happened. And I was actually working with a woman from uh, SCLC, I think, okay. Shirley Mercer, I think her name was. Okay. Um, but I know that there was a quick response. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. was just yeah. immediate. While we were there, even during the movement, um, the, uh, I think I, uh, w we were able to, they talked to us, the mm -hmm. Selma officials. Yeah. It was kind of funny, you know. Uh, the SNCC office was directly across mm -hmm. the street from the police station. <laughs> and we could actually see people in jail mm -hmm. through our window. Mm -hmm. So it was this very physically close is, proximity. very different from the image we get of the police in Selma because all we have is those big... Uh, pictures of pushing back and beating and uh, yeah. that there wasn't any communication at all. Well, it's the state troopers, yeah. which is kind of interesting, you know, because everybody thought the state was more um, liberal mm -hmm. than Selma, mm -hmm. but it's the state troopers yeah. who are beating people on the Edmund Pettus And you, you mentioned bridge. Wilson Baker, the director of public safety, yes. as somebody you could talk to. Well, I had his phone. I don't know how I got yeah. it. I had his phone number mm -hmm. at home. And in the office. Yeah. I mean, I, and I can't even remember, did he wake, walk up to me one day and say, well, you know, if you ever need me, here's my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But I did call him yeah. one night when we went to a restaurant mm -hmm. on Halloween, which wasn't smart. And, um, you know, it looked like people were going to try to hurt us. And he sent a car. Yeah. No. <laughs> sent a couple police cars, take us home. No. I, Worth told me stories about um, the, the, police, uh, the uh -huh. police station being across from the office and all. Was that all reset before you got there? Or? Yeah. He says he set, he set that up. And so that when he went out into the field, he could talk to people and say, well, you know where my office is, and they'd all have to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think he was there in that early group. Mm -hmm, yeah. uh, he came early. So that was, yeah, that was all set up before we got there. When you were in Alabama this time, you also had an active social life. Well, kind of. I'm talking about <laughs> <I> <laughs> meeting did. your husband. husband. Yeah, I did, meet, I did meet my first husband there, yes. <laughs> he was the project Silas director. Norman, yeah. and, uh, and you were married when? We married in the fall of 1967. Mm -hmm. And he had orders to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was on that break. Uh, they give you like, I think, a 30-day, or it might even been a 60-day break before you actually mm -hmm. transfer over. He had applied to be for CO standing before he was drafted, and they didn't give it to him. Mm -hmm. But he learned while he was in the Army. He kept going to different schools mm -hmm. to avoid going to Vietnam. And then he... Uh, learned while he was in the army that in that space you're no longer under the chain of command mm -hmm. and you go straight to the top and that's what he did and he was an officer and as an officer the burden of proof of your being a CO is now on the army not on you it's just the opposite if you're an enlisted man because obviously they don't want a pacifist in charge of troops yeah. And so um, he, was, he was successful in that, um, in doing that. Mm -hmm. I had told him, uh, you know, after he proposed, and I knew this was hanging over him, I said, you know, well, if you go to Canada, I'll go with you. If you go to Africa, I'll go with you. If you go to jail, I'll wait for you. He said, my mother took him aside and said, young man, you are not taking my daughter anywhere where I have to cross an international boundary to see her. <laughs> and if you go to jail, I'll be tempted to shoot you before you get out of the courtroom because my daughter will not be married <laughs> to a felon. <laughs> had, had you and your parents been reconciled by then? We were... I was living at home. Yeah. We weren't reconciled. Mm -hmm. They, my Again... 
I believe my mother insisted that I be allowed back at home against my father's wishes. And, uh, you know, so there was still a lot of tension mm -hmm. that really didn't dissipate until shortly before my mother died, yeah. yeah. And you entered the grad program at Wayne State in the summer of 66? I did. I and did. you and Silas were married in 67. Yeah. You had, uh, then had a, a baby, small son, yeah. and you decided to go back to Albany. We did. We Sherrod by that time was um, doing farming. Mm -hmm. He had a huge uh, community. I think it was the size of New York City or something. It was this huge uh, plot of land called New Communities, and uh, we discussed, you know, going to work with him. And we went down there to visit, and he took us around, and he took us through the house, and here and there, and the house was all shot up in the back. <laughs> it was just sort of a matter of fact, you yeah. know, as well, you know. And um, I thought we didn't really have the right to risk the baby's life. Yeah. Um, and we both thought we should have more education. And so Silas went to medical school. And um, after we had two more children, yeah. I went to. Uh, back to school and entered a Ph.D. program in history, yeah. In 1967, um, you, were, you were down, then you went back. Changes were taking place in SNCC. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about how you fit into the discussions, how you fit into the, the changes in direction in SNCC. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, um, I had a habit of going to SNCC meetings but not actually going to the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I would stay outside the meeting. <laughs> and why, why didn't you go inside? I'd like to meet with people from other projects, find out what they were doing, and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, I would go in and out. I There was a lot of tension in those meetings in those days. I didn't take it as seriously, probably, as mm -hmm. I should have. Yeah because I thought that we had our marching orders, so to speak. We had Miss Baker's, we had a philosophy. Mm -hmm. And to me, the discussions that were taking place were within that context. Mm -hmm. And I believe to this day, easily resolvable. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I was someone who was there in the beginning or close to the beginning, and saw SNCC as a black organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I saw the Mississippi Summer Project mm -hmm. as the aberration. Mm -hmm. And then what happened afterwards as a return to where it started. Yeah. So it wasn't, I wasn't going, oh, this is something new. <laughs> I was going like, oh, this is something old. And it's actually something that um, uh, Stokely says in The Black Power, you know, that it's, it's just, uh, it was, we were trying to build vehicles of black power yeah. from the beginning. Yeah. Um, so when the black power slogan came out, you were not surprised or no. turned off or? No, I thought it's what we were doing yeah. all along yeah. was building vehicles of black power. <laughs> uh, and interestingly enough, one of the, my parents' objections was to the integrated nature of the Friends of SNCC. Uh, because uh, we actually had a, a party at my house in uh, Detroit after Stokely gave a Black Power speech. And I swear, my mother said to Stokely when he came in the house, Oh, young man, I'm so glad you all finally got some sense. And now what you need to do is organize, organize, organize. <laughs> Which, of course, was his slogan there. <laughs> She loved black power. Oh, yeah. Um, so, no, it just seemed to me the same. But I think, of course, the people who had come in either in the summer of 1964 mm -hmm. or afterwards saw the early SNCC as a, quote, integrationist organization, mm -hmm. which I, I didn't understand that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel that what we were trying to do was to integrate into white society. I never had that feeling either, that I thought what we were trying to do was build these vehicles of black power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and to radicalize 
the entire political structure of the country. Um, because the, what, what oppressed black people in the South would want and would lobby for would be so much more liberal and radical than any other group of people in the country. That was my understanding of what we were doing. And so I didn't see, I didn't see this a big change. Um, when did you, hold on a second. The other thing that was so clear was that we were still talking about a movement based in the black community. Mm -hmm. There was a brief talk about, you know, there were these white projects in, this, in uh, Mississippi, but there really wasn't any discussion about building a black and white southern movement yeah. together. Mm -hmm. you know. I do think one of the um, opportunities that we missed because of these discussions in the meeting was bringing the Southern movements together, mm -hmm. uh, you know, creating uh, at least a meeting of the Southwest Georgia, the Mississippi, mm -hmm. the Cambridge movement, mm -hmm. bringing these projects together and developing a, a platform. Mm -hmm. By this time there was more activity in cities in the north. Mm -hmm. and and you were, you and your husband and your family were in Detroit. Yes. And you went back to graduate school in history mm -hmm. at the University of Michigan. Yeah. Uh, briefly tell us about what you've been up to the last 45 years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think uh, a combination of studying history, teaching history. Um, I didn't uh, finish my, uh, the Ph.D. program because of a series of family emergencies. I raised a family, I took care of my parents, and I've done a number of community projects, like an anti-hunger project, uh, a program for children, a tutorial program for children with uh, sickle cell anemia. Um, and I stayed active with a number of what I would call post-SNCC projects, um, helping to organize some uh, retrospective conferences. Uh, about SNCC, um, helping to get uh, Curtis Hayes out of jail in mm -hmm. Liberia, yeah. <laughs> um, things like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us about your family. Well, I have three uh, wonderful sons uh, who we raised in the city of Detroit, in the inner city of Detroit. And so they and we have experienced, um, I guess what I would call a new set of dangers um, in terms of uh, attacks and arrests by police and the level of violence um, that's now, I think, within, within the black community. My son was a pallbearer. Um, two weeks after he graduated from high school. And within my little circle of friends in Detroit, at least four women have lost their sons to gun violence. It's, it, it became a pro forma. Yeah. You know, if, if your son came home late, you call a morgue yeah. to make sure they weren't there. Um, and they were regularly harassed by the police. Mm -hmm. And what are they doing now? Well, one son actually is a lawyer, <laughs> and he, he said, unlike many other lawyers, he believes his clients <laughs> when, when they say certain things happened. Uh, that's my youngest, our youngest son, and the other two are physicians. One's a nephrologist with a subspecialty in kidney transplant medication, and the other uh, has, uh, uh, has his MD, he's a hospitalist, but he also has a PhD in um, information 
computers and he's questioning the entire logic of mathematics. <laughs> Your mother would be very proud. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, somebody got, became professional, right? <laughs> Beginning in the 21st century and even before, you were involved in a project as one of the instigators to gather the remembrances and the es essays written by SNCC women. The result was a marvelous book uh, published in 20... We're going again with the introduction. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, well, better give it just in case we didn't, it didn't close the file properly. Okay. S start where? Um, you can start with the introduction. Okay. Because we, um, All right. Um, Early in the 21st century, you and a group of other women in SNCC began to compile a group of essays written by SNCC women talking about their experiences in the movement. The result was a wonderful collection called Hands on the Freedom Plow, Personal Accounts by Women in SNCC, published in 2010 by the University of Illinois Press. Uh, show it to us and tell us something about it. Well, uh, Hands on the Freedom Plow. And it's the stories of 52 women who were active in the civil rights movement in projects connected with SNCC. Um, it has the stories of uh, most of the women were college students at the time, but we also have included uh, women who were middle-aged activists, uh, white women, black women. There are two Hispanic women in the book. So... And for those of you watching this now into the future, it is also available in paperback edition. Yes. And we recommend it highly. <laughs> Martha Noonan, thank you very much for being with us. This has been a real pleasure for us. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.